Good morning. I'm Valerie Fleischman, Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. And on behalf of MHA, welcome to today's Executive Insights event. MHA is excited to continue this series, which features candid interviews with leaders who power our hospitals and health systems. Today's theme is behind the breakthroughs. A few logistics before we start. We will be recording this session for those who aren't able to join and all lines are in listen only mode. If you have questions during our time today, please enter them into the chat. The questions will come directly to us and we'll do our best to address as many as we can at the end of today's session. Following the event, we'll be sending out a recording along with a brief survey. I wanna take a moment now to thank MHA's 2022 sponsors for their support in underwriting MHA's education programs. In particular, I would like to thank today's program sponsor, Hush Blackwell. A valued supporter of MHA, Hush Blackwell offers comprehensive counsel on day-to-day -day operations and long-term strategies for industries including healthcare, life sciences, and technology. Now, I'm delighted to hand it over to Crystal Bloom, a partner at Hush Blackwell, to say a few words. Thanks, Valerie. Good morning, everyone. As Valerie mentioned, I'm Crystal Bloom, a partner at the law firm of Hush Blackwell. My practice focuses on providing guidance to healthcare providers with respect to state and federal regulatory requirements, particularly focusing on issues involving the Department of Public Health and Determination of Need program. Many of you may not know of Hush Blackwell, but may know me and my colleagues from our prior firm, Summit Health Law Partners, and before that, Barrett and Single. A year ago, we merged with Hush Blackwell in an effort to expand our capabilities and expertise to best serve our clients. It has proved to be a beneficial decision for our clients because now we are part of a national law firm with a significant healthcare practice of 150 plus attorneys and professionals whose primary focus is on, is on serving healthcare clients. Hush Blackwell is ranked number three among the American Health Law Association top honors. Through Hush Blackwell, we have been able to continue to provide the locally based expertise and service we always have, and at the same time, provide our clients with resources across the country in any area that touches healthcare. Beyond legal expertise, we are a front runner in transparent communication, streamlined processes, and technology investment. First and foremost, our people-centered culture transforms client connections into trusted, long-lasting business partnerships. Thank you to MHA for providing me with this opportunity to speak to its members. Now I am pleased to introduce our moderator for the morning, Steve Walsh, President and CEO of the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. Thank you, Crystal, for both your expertise and for your partnership. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you, Valerie, uh, once again, for bringing us back. And to our audience, welcome back to our Executive Insights Series. It is great to have you with us as the fall begins and the world of healthcare remains busier than ever. As Valerie mentioned, these sessions give us a unique opportunity to hear about the stories behind the Commonwealth's top healthcare leaders, whether it's their career journeys, their vision for the future of our system, or simply what keeps them grounded outside of work. We get to hear about all of that in about the time it takes to drink your morning coffee. And our guest today is no different, with Dr. Laurie Glimpscher being one of the most recognizable voices, not just here in Massachusetts, but in medical circles around the globe. Dr. Glimpscher took the helm as president and CEO of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in 2016, where she now oversees one of the most innovative and trusted cancer centers in the world. Since day one at Dana-Farber, she has used her background as a renowned immunologist to push the Institute to new and bold levels of research, patient care, and as the title of today's episode suggests, life-saving breakthroughs. Dr. Glimpscher is also director of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center and is the Richard and Susan Smith Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. She returned to Boston after serving as Dean and Professor of Medicine for Weill Cornell Medicine and Provost of Medical Affairs at Cornell University. She's a member of virtually every prestigious National Academy and professional society and has spoken across the globe about her trailblazing cancer research and health policy. I'd also be remiss to not mention that Dr. Glipschitz's strong reputation for mentorship and her commitment to the next generation of medical professionals, which we'll dive into a bit later. Dr. Glimpscher, thank you so much for being with us today. 
Well, thank you very much, Steve. And I think that all of the CEOs at all of the hospitals in Massachusetts are very grateful to you and the MHA for all you do to help us and to make sure that we can deliver the best uh, care for our patients. So thank you, and I'm happy to be here. Well, thanks for, thanks for saying that. Uh, I wanna start just in, in the beginning, really. What drew you to healthcare? And what, in, during that journey, ultimately led you to oversee Dana-Farber? Well, I would say um, <laughs> that I started very early. My dad was a physician scientist. And I remember, and I couldn't have been more than six years old when I decided I would dissect a frog um, in front of my two sisters who are absolutely horrified <laughs> by this. So I started early. Um, I was always interested in experiments and, uh, and, and being a physician and a scientist. Um, and I think I became a scientist really because I loved it. Um, I, it sort of chose me rather than vice versa. Uh, I was raised uh, here in Massachusetts in, in Brookline, and um, then I attended uh, Harvard University and then Harvard Medical School, and I trained at Massachusetts General Hospital in internal medicine and rheumatology, and then moved over to be uh, a faculty member at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a rheumatologist by training as, as well as a scientist. You know, I think I, I came from a family uh, who had a deep sense of public service. So I think that's why I knew early that I wanted to be a scientist, but also a physician. Um, being a scientist is a, uh, it's an up and down because as a scientist, you can, you can and should ask big questions. If you don't ask those big questions, then you're not going to be able to make major contributions to improving patient care. Um, and I was aware that, uh, you know, scientists fail 90% of the time. 90% uh, of the time, the experiments you're doing don't work out or your papers don't get accepted or your grants don't get funded. So you really have to be very stubborn and passionate about being a scientist and of course also being a physician. Um, I was fortunate. I, I was able to make some successful discoveries and, and have had a wonderful career in science. It's been exhilarating. It's been up and down. And uh, you know, I ran I ran a lab at Harvard Medical School for many, many years. And I really grew to love the role of mentoring. That's always been a, a very top priority for me. Um, I think the most important thing we can do as scientists is to mentor the next generation of brilliant scientists and physicians. And uh, as I grew older, uh, I thought that it would be wonderful if I could really enable the, care, the careers of other scientists and other physicians rather than focusing just on my own lab, although I still do have a small lab at Dana-Farber. And uh, as I was thinking about that in my um, early 50s, uh, I was contacted by the Dean of Wa Cornell Medical School um, and the search committee. Uh, they were looking for a new Dean at Wa Cornell Medical School. And, I decided it was time to make a transition and to take on a larger goal uh, beyond my individual goals and to begin to work on behalf of an institution. Um, it gave me the opportunity to do something totally different uh, and, and hopefully to make a bigger impact on the field because academic medical centers are in some threat right now. Uh, and I wanted to advocate for for American, for academic medical centers, um, as well as continuing to improve patient care uh, at, at uh, Weill Cornell. And I had a wonderful five years at Weill Cornell, but then I got another call from the chair of the board of Dana-Farber, uh, Josh Beckenstein, who's uh, chair of the board, and asked me if I would be interested in coming back to Harvard. And I, I, I absolutely, um, there were a number of reasons why I wanted to come back to Boston. 
One was that Dana-Farber is an incredible institution, and we'll probably talk more about that in a little while. Um, absolutely uh, first rate in research and, and developing new therapeutics for patients with cancer, and uh, also, also delivering uh, the really incredible care to, to all of our patients. And the second reason was that uh, two of my three children, uh, my older son, Hugh, who is a um, thoracic surgeon at Mass General, and my younger son, Jay Gawkenkloss, who, as you know, is the US uh, uh, congressman from Massachusetts District 4. And they both wrote me and said, mom, we really miss you, so please come back to Boston. So that really seal sealed the deal. And, um, you know, it was a return to my roots, uh, really, in some ways. I would say that um, uh, both of my parents had a strong influence on my life and my career. My mom was, was a stay-at-home mom, and she was wonderful and caring for me and my sisters. Both of my sisters are, are lawyers. Uh, but she and my father always expected us to have independent careers. And that was, that was very important. And my father had a particularly strong influence. Um, and when I, I remember when I was uh, a young scientist, um, I, was, I was in the lab, uh, my fourth year in medical school in the lab of Dr. Harvey Cantor, who was an uh, outstanding scientist. And, um, you know, uh, one, uh, one day uh, the, the experiments were very difficult and things weren't working well. And so I decided I would, I would just got, go home. And I walked out of the lab, I was frustrated. And I ran into my dad, who at that time was chair of orthopedic surgery at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, we actually were the first father and daughter professors at Harvard Medical School. And my dad said, uh, oh, where are you going? And I, I said, well, I'm going to go home because it's really been a discouraging day and nothing has worked. And he said, oh, no, you're not going home. You're going to go right back to the laboratory because that's exactly when you have to focus and continue and push and try twice as hard. And so I went back to the laboratory and uh, he was absolutely right. Well, that's, that's pretty remarkable. And uh, what a great story. And Got a couple of family open threads here. I want to just just jump on. I had guessed accountant for one of your sisters when you said the reaction to the frog dissection, but lawyer would have been my second choice. Um, but I'll say your toughest job, having been elected for twelve years myself, uh, is being the mother of an elected official. I know my mother had the most difficult time um, because you are right in the front row. Uh, and oftentimes the moms uh, see things even or, or it takes even longer for us to get over things than it does the candidate. So uh, congrats on on that role in your life as well and continuing to to bring up public servants. Um, so you're a researcher at heart. When you go into the office now as a leader, how do you take what you learned as a clinician and a researcher and inform your role as president and CEO at Data Farmer? Well, being a scientist and a physician is really a good good grounds to uh, treat to, to to test how you can be as a leader, uh, because as a scientist, as I said before, you have to be willing to take risks. You have to be willing to take on daring experiments, most of which are going to fail, because that's really the only way to make transformative discoveries. And and I think that that sense of boldness and also the commitment to to generate the next generation of brilliant scientists and physicians, um, leaders need to be bold. Uh, we, we can't just accept the status quo. We, I mean, we have very ambitious goals at Dana-Farber. We wanna make major advances in cancer care and discovery. And to do that, to make really meaningful progress, uh, you have to act on those priorities and you need to persevere. Um, that it's not easy to be a physician and to be a scientist and to run a cancer center or any hospital. Um, but you have to keep on trying and you have to be innovative. You have to imagine different approaches that will leapfrog uh, treatment for our patients. 
and I think it's, you know, particularly important, at least for me to be a physician scientist. And that's because, you know, physicians often have to make decisions without 100% of the data being available to them. And so that, that training as a physician, and, and I really consider myself as a physician scientist, uh, really prepares one to run a large institution um, and be willing to move it forward when you think it necessary. Um, I, I mean, leadership requires a, a similar sense of perseverance and creativity as does science. Uh, the work is, is hard. There are always setbacks, but, you know, I, I know I need to persevere to show up every day and, and give it my all each day. You know, when I think of the COVID pandemic, <laughs> that really gives us all some context on these things to get through that. And it's, it is not fully over yet, as we all know. Yeah. You really have to be able to, to, to be work through challenges and you have to be calm and thoughtful. And you also have to listen to and respect the people that one works with. Um, that's, that's very, very important. I want to get to COVID in a, in a minute because I think you have a unique perspective, but I just want to talk about just for a, a workforce for a second. So you have a um, you have the ability to be innovative and you've done it throughout your career, but you also have a deep understanding of education and a passion for mentorship. So when you look at how to attract people into the workforce, are you thinking of any things that we should be trying that that you and your colleagues are doing to try to get people back into this vocation? Well, I'll tell you that within six weeks, after the COVID pandemic attacked all of us, we had our researchers back in the laboratory. And of course, our clinicians never stopped for a minute. Um, a pandemic cannot stop cancer. We had patients to treat. I think if, if you wanna be a CEO and to run uh, an institution, you have to put yourself last. Um, you have to be in a position in your in one's career where you get tremendous joy and pleasure for enabling the careers of other people and the health of our patients. And to me, mentorship has, has always been foundational for success. I've been privileged to mentor many, many postdoctoral fellows and graduate students. And I, I really treasure that time um, that I spend guiding young early career scientists. And I think honestly, I learn as much from them as they learn from me. And I've been fortunate to have strong mentors and that's been helpful to me. And I get, I t I get great pleasure for um, being a mentor. And it, I think it's, uh, I'm very proud to have helped the people that I have mentored um, and become professionally successful and satisfied. I think, you know, one shouldn't take the role of a CEO if you're not ready to put the institution first and to be really happy and joyful when physicians, scientists that, that are at your institution are successful and I get great joy from that. And I, you know, when I open a, a science magazine and I see somebody that I've mentored or somebody at Dana-Farber uh, produce a beautiful, beautiful discovery that's gonna help our patients uh, to treat cancer, it, it just thrills me. I mean, I'm so delighted by that. And it's remarkable if people were discouraged by that 90% that you talk about, uh, how many lives we wouldn't be able to save if we didn't find the 10%. So it's a, it's a pretty remarkable analogy. I want to turn to Dana-Farber during the, during the pandemic. And you obviously were an extraordinary leader among your colleagues throughout the entire two years and continuing today. Um, and you were there for everybody and on our, our calls. But you're also running a hospital that I get very scared about because cancer didn't stop during COVID-19, as you mentioned, and people weren't coming to the hospital. How did you find your patients? And, and when they come now, are they sicker than they would have been? Are you concerned that we might have missed some diagnosis over the time? And what are you and your team doing to try to make sure you're meeting the needs of patients that are now just starting to come back to the hospital um, after the last two and a half years? 
Well, it was a challenging time for everyone, for every hospital, um, our staff, our doctors, our nurses, our patients and their families. Um, as you know, COVID-19 posed a special risk to people with cancer because their immune system is uh, not as strong. They have a weakened immune system while they try to uh, attack uh, their cancer cells. And we very quickly, we had to put um, a, a totally new environment for in-person care by making sure we had the right safety measures in place to protect our patients and staff. That was masking, it was uh, personal protective equipment, um, physical distancing, uh, and, and so many more things. And we quickly um, started using a very robust telemedicine system, which we had used maybe you know, for 10, 10 patients before that, but in a matter of weeks, we went from conducting almost no telemedicine uh, visits at all to conducting more than 3000 a week. And this, this was um, really convenient for our patients. Um, whenever we could, we kept them at home and uh, treated them by telemedicine. And, and the other advantage of that was that we of course could not allow any visitors into Dana-Farber as true of all hospitals because it was dangerous for them and for the patients. Uh, so by doing this by telemedicine when possible, uh, we could include the family in a telemedicine visit and they were now able to join the virtual appointment. The other thing that was critical is we really had to ensure that our clinical trials could continue because for 20% of patients with cancer, that's their best option for treatment. And fortunately, um, nearly all of our patients on interventional treatment trials were maintained and we continue to enroll new patients as well. Uh, most hospitals just couldn't do that, but cancer hospitals were able to do that because it was the best option for those patients. And you know, we learned a lot. I think everybody learned a great deal about how we can improve operational efficiency and convenience for our patients. I mean, I remember a, a, a more than one patient saying to me, you know, I feel safer at Dana-Farber than I do at any place else in the world because you are all so strict and, and uh, devoted to making sure that we are sheltered safely. And do you do you do you hope or think that a lot of those new efficiencies and particularly around telemedicine will become permanent and continue uh, into the future? I certainly hope so, Steve. And you know that has been a um, difficult. I mean, for now we're still uh, on emergency uh, status, and so we can get um, reimbursed for telemedicine. This is critical for our patients and it's critical for our ability to treat them. So uh, we hope that telemedicine will be reimbursed at parity as it has been over the last two yep. and a half years. Um, so, you know. So you're doing so much in terms of innovation. Sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the amazing things that you and your team are doing. Any recent developments that you wanna talk about that you're really excited about? Well, there are a number of priorities that uh, are, are, are so exciting um, because while cancer science and uh, therapeutics have skyrocketed in the last two decades, we still have a long ways to go. And, you know, I'll mention just a few of them. There's the, the first revolution was the appreciation and this was really um, discovered at uh, Dana-Farber that normal cells turn into cancer cells because of the mutation in their DNA. And that recognition allowed us to identify most of all of the genetic mutations for most cancers. And once you know what your target is, you can develop a treatment for that mutation that disables it. And you know, an example for that is lung cancer, 
of patients with lung cancer have a mutation in a gene called EGFR. And at Dana-Farber, we were able to produce a tool compound that disabled that genetic mutation and allowed us to treat our patients with stage four metastatic lung cancer and keep them alive for years. Remarkable. And the second revolution, of course, was immunotherapy. And I'm an immunologist. I fell in love with immunology in my fourth year at medical school. And, uh, you know, we tried for a hundred years to figure out how to activate your own immune system to fight off cancer cells. Um, and now, uh, thanks to Dr. Gordon Freeman, who is a faculty member at Dana-Farber, uh, we can now treat about 25% of patients successfully with immunotherapy. Now that's good, that's great, it's transformative, but we're not stopping there because what about the other 75% of patients yeah. who don't respond to immunotherapy? And I'm happy to say that our, uh, some of our scientists have now discovered several new targets that may allow activation of the immune system in more patients than 25%. So we're very excited about that. It's, um, it's an incredible work, yeah. So thank you for all that you and your team are doing. We're coming up on the end, so I, I need to get to a lightning round and get some other questions in here for our audience. Uh, I, I, I bet your, your first job was you were a researcher at age six, but I'm gonna have to ask, what was your first job? My first job actually was in high school. Um, I was a dishwasher. Okay. And, and we have a have a house in Martha's Vineyard, which my parents uh, got uh, many many years ago. And um, my parents thought it was very important for us to work. And I became a dishwasher at Homeport Restaurant, which still exists. Oh, in I know Memphis. Homeport. Yes, yes. That was uh, that was really my first. Uh, and, and speaking of restaurants, best restaurant in Boston. What's your favorite restaurant in Boston? I really love um, 75 Chestnut. We live in the back bay right. now, and uh, it's a wonderful restaurant. And, and last one, last great movie you saw? The Queen's Gambit. Oh. Um, I like Jess, and yes. I it was a fantastic movie. Tremendous, um, yes. Yes. Uh, all right. I'm going to close on a question that we, we ask everybody. And I think this is um, uh, certainly right, right in your wheelhouse. Any advice for some of our emerging leaders that watch these sessions? Um, if someone's drawn to healthcare leadership, uh, how, what advice would you give them? And how does mentorship factor into the picture? So I'd give them the same advice. I think that, that I tell our young postdoctoral fellows and, and that is, um, to succeed, you, first of all, you need to have self-confidence. You have to be, per 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 you, you need to stick with it and be passionate about it. And you need to respect the people who report to you. And it's, it's really important to say thank you in a sincere way. Uh, you got to find ways to be resilient, um, especially during very difficult times. And I find that it's really good to not have a big ego. That's that's not that's not helpful if you are a CEO. Mentorship is absolutely it's tremendously important to cultivate the next generation of healthcare leaders. Um, to share knowledge and wisdom and, and to provide support and putting your money where your mouth is as well. When you, when you see that you have a brilliant scientist who may not have had his or her uh, grant funded, but they're doing fabulous work, you gotta come up with resources to keep them going. So I've always been a big advocate of career, for career growth and, and helping young people succeed. And I'd say the most important thing is to enjoy what you do. Um, you need that passion, that kind of passion where you know you wake up in the morning and you can't wait to get to work because it's what, what you want, it's what you want to do more than anything else. Well, we certainly um we certainly feel your passion. Um and thank you. And and as as always with these sessions, we could go on and on and on, but we we like to keep them tight and get through as much information as we can. So I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for your friendship. Um, and thank you for all you are doing um, at your institution to save lives. It's extraordinary work, necessary work. And we are all, um, we are all incredibly grateful uh, for you and your team. So thanks for joining us today uh, to talk a few minutes about you and your career and what's happening, the exciting things that are happening at Data Farber. We certainly will be following up in the months um, and years ahead. Uh, to our guests, thanks for sharing your morning coffee with us today. And please keep an eye out for the next Executive Insight Session announcement. We're also in the midst of planning our annual Women's Leadership in Healthcare Conference on December 1st, and would love to see you there. MHA hosts educational programming like this every week of the year, and we welcome you to visit mhalink.org for a full listing of upcoming opportunities. Dr. Glimcher, thank you so much again for joining us this morning. We appreciate it uh, and look forward to your work ahead. Thank you. It's a pleasure.